Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. Today, we have someone calling in from Malibu, California, and she is one of the original Hollywood stunt women, I think, that ever started in the game. I want to welcome Miss Diane Peterson. How are you doing, Diane? Great. Hi, John. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we had uh, we had Diane on previously, and we had a few technical difficulties, so we said we got to do this again and, and get a better recording, and I'm glad we did. And uh, she had a book um, just recently come out called Hollywood Stunt Woman. And I don't know, tell me a little bit about how this journey started and what was the uh, initiation of starting this journey? So, you know, I've been a stunt woman for, wow, over 40 years now. So I've been enjoying it for all this time. And I was working on a show and I was telling stories, as great stunt stories. And one of my cohorts said, you know, you should write a book. And I was like, mm, I don't know about that. And then I thought, yeah, I should write a book. I should write down all these wonderful uh, scenes that I've been in, action scenes. And so I started taking a writing class at Santa Monica College. And my teacher said, you know, all this action stuff is great, but we want to know about you, about your personal life and and what makes you do this? Why, do you, why would you want to risk your life? And so then I started really di diving deep and figuring out what makes me do this and what are the things that I've been afraid of and how did I overcome those fears and what made me keep following my dream when obstacles got in my way. So it was really a good self-reflection. And I hope my book is an inspiration to anyone that has a dream and wants to follow their dream. And even though fears come come up in your head, you got to like not let the fear bully you and you got to press on and make your dreams come to a reality. So I'm hoping people get that message and inspire inspires the reader to follow their dreams. You grew up on the East Coast, correct? Yeah. And, and your dad was... Um in the trucking business was that it he taught you how to drive a truck originally yes i yeah my dad had a trucking company plaza trucking and ever since i was little I, I, he taught me how to drive when i was about seven years old and i just loved it i just loved being behind the wheel and and uh stepping on the gas and then as i got older i got to drive the bigger trucks until i got to uh, was able to drive the 18 wheelers and uh in a couple shows i actually drove an 18 wheeler so yeah he was really instrumental in planting my love of driving now when you think about your mom and dad and you think about fear how did they live their lives and you know were they fearful or did you get challenged more by your parents how what type of people were they so you know my mom was afraid of everything in fact you know in my book in the beginning i i talk about me being on a very high ledge doing a stunt and in the back of my head i could hear my mother saying don't go near the edge don't go near the edge because we lived in a duplex house on the top floor and there was a balcony on the outside and every time I went near the edge, my mother was like, yeah, don't go near the edge. And that implanted a fear of heights in me, which, you know, I really had to overcome. And on the other hand, my dad was fearless. My dad was like, go for it. You can do it. You can do anything you set your mind to. So I had both ends of the spectrum. And yep. fortunately, the go for it side was the dominant side for me. What part of the world? Where your parents from? Well, New Jersey, actually. Yeah, they they grew up in New Jersey, and that's where I grew up. And um, I stayed in New Jersey until I left for college. And I went to college. I graduated from the University of Miami, and then I moved to L.A. And there wasn't there a story you were telling me last time about you did a few things in New York City, and then you finally took the leap and moved to LA. What was, what happened in the city at that time? Well, at that time, you know, I, I, I started out being an actress and I had an acting role on the old TV show Kojak. And my first day on the set, I was the woman with the baby carriage and I was crossing a street on the Upper East Side, and two guys were doing a, a car chase with a police car, and they almost hit the baby carriage. And I was like, 
wow, I want to be driving the car in this car chase. And so I talked to the stuntmen after that, and I said, I ride horses and motorcycles, and I really want to do stunts. And at that time, they said, forget it. We put the wigs on, and we do it. Because they didn't have any stunt women in New York City at the time. So I kept um, bugging them for a job, and I'd have little acting roles, and they'd be doing a fight scene, and I'd watch them and keep bugging them for a job. And one day they called me and they said, we have a job for you. You have to get hit by a car. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and they said, don't worry. We'll teach you how to do it. And so they began to teach me how to get hit by a car. And got hit pretty hard in the knees by the car. And I said, that's it. You know, I was acting. I was modeling. And I really didn't want to get hurt. And the stuntman that was teaching me said, you know, Diane, it's like falling off a horse. If you don't get right back out there and do it again, you'll never do another stunt in your life. I fell off plenty of horses. So I knew to get back out out there and do it again. Did a beautiful car hit, and then I was in the club. Then they invited me to join the Stunt Men's Association. They began teaching me everything. So it was really, really a great training ground, and, you know, they were they were my mentors for sure. But what happened yeah. is, in the winters, there was hardly any work because the weather was so bad, and uh, after a couple seasons in New York, I, I said, I got to move to L.A. And they were like, no, you're the only stunt woman we have. You have <laughs> yeah. to stay here. But I said, look, that's where the work is. And I knew I followed my calling and, and moved to L.A. and never looked back. I mean, getting hit by a car, I mean, that could go wrong, could it not? I mean, that's a big deal, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it, it could go uh, terribly wrong. And, you know, even though you, you pad up with elbow pads and knee pads and hip pads, I mean, one wrong move and you really could get run over. And, and, you know, the way it was, you know, just getting hit in the knees was enough to, to get my attention. Mm -hmm. I had the knee pads on, so... You know, I came out unscathed. However, after the car hit me, I flew into the windshield and I actually broke the windshield with my elbow. Mm. But I had an elbow pad on, so my elbow remained okay. Wow. I mean, when you take that hit, what did that what did that hit feel like? You know, it happens very quickly. And the thing with doing a car hit, you're in motion as the driver of the car brakes for an instant. So at that very precise instant, the timing has to be impeccable. The hood of the car will go down. I fling myself onto the roof of the car, and then the driver slams on the gas which propels me off the side of the car. So it happens really quick, and it's all in the timing. You just have to concentrate on the timing and concentrate on the stunt going perfectly right. So when you made this move to L.A., what kind of progression did you see in the business as far as the safety protocol from that time you took that hit through the whole process? Did things get better? Did they use did they use you know, stump people less or more? How did, what, what went on when you got really into the business? Well, I, you know, I became involved with Screen Actors Guild with our union and I was on the stunt, stunt and safety committee and um, working to make stunts safer. But, um, you know, when I first started there, people did high falls into cardboard boxes and then the airbag came. So the airbag was much safer when used in the proper way with people that knew what they were doing. And then just having safety on the set, having a phone number, if you felt unsafe, you could call someone. So there was a lot of um, great strides made in safety because people were getting hurt and killed. And four of my friends have been killed doing stunts. When you were in L.A., you booked a, booked a pretty big gig, didn't you? Like the one that you said was most memorable? Yeah, I've, I've booked a lot of really great gigs. I mean, probably the most memorable is working on Titanic because, I mean, Titanic was just such an epic movie. And, you know, I was down in Rosarita Beach 
working on that with there were stunt people from all over the world there and james cameron his attention to detail was amazing you know on on the in the book it said it was a night and it would take hours to get everyone ready for the stunts to happen at night and then we get on board and the el nortes would come and he'd say, that's a wrap. We'll see you tomorrow. Because he was, everything had to be true to the moment. But it was amazing to work on, on that film. And how do you, like, when you're doing something, when you think about Titanic, you don't think, you don't think stump people. I mean, and you said there was a lot of stump people all over the world. What was... What was the, some of the things you had to do while we were on set? Well, one of the big scenes, uh, if you'll remember, is when people were getting rescued in the lifeboats. And supposedly, you know, they were yelling for women and children only. But there were, you know, guys jumping in and anybody that really wanted to get saved. And we were in the lifeboats. They didn't have it all uh, choreographed well so that they would drop evenly. So the boats were like tipping and, and supposedly that's what happened in, in the real life. The, they weren't expecting to have to use the lifeboats. And so when all these people were into the lifeboats and they were letting them down, People were falling out of the boats and, and you know, it was it was quite hectic. And then, you know, when the ship broke in half, the people sliding down the decks and people jumping overboard. I mean, there, there was a ton, a ton of stunts. Where was this set up and what did that look like? Did you physically see the boat? They, they set it up where the boat split in half? So, yes, this was Rosarita Beach, Mexico, is where the studio was. And they had a facade of the boat. So they had, from looking straight on, you could see the entire boat. But the back was scaffolding where you could climb up. And, and they had it, they portioned off part of the ocean. And they built a, a wall so they could raise and lower the height of the water. They could lower the water, bring cranes in and equipment trucks and then take the trucks away and bring up the water to the correct water level. So it was quite an operation. They also had the boat, like the uh, bow of the boat and the stern on hydraulics so they could uh, raise and lower that as they needed. I mean, it was really an engineering marvel. And you said James Cameron was definitely had an engineer mindset. He was amazing. I mean, his attention to detail down to the the hat that one of the extras was wearing. It was like four o'clock in the morning, and he saw this hat, and it wasn't from the period. And he just took the hat and threw it into the ocean. But his attention to detail was just phenomenal and it was so great to work with him and on a picture of that magnitude and what did that look like with the crew like how many people were staying in that area working on this project oh oh hundreds and hundreds of people i mean they were in all all the hotels in in the area and like i said from all over the world like you know the stuntmen from the czech republic and london and the stunt coordinator was from england so he knew a lot of european stunt people and, you know we were fortunate because we're we're in a union screen actors guild union so mm -hmm. we get paid you know hand and some of the other people, you know, they're not in the union, weren't paid it as well as us. Also, that's 20 some years ago that we did that film. I still get residuals today after all this time. So it's it's been a wonderful money making job. Plus, just the joy of being on such a blockbuster. And you had some experiences with some some pretty big actors. What was some of your most memorable experiences with certain actors that we may or may not know? Well, you know, uh, there's there's been so many great actors that that I've worked with, but. You know, he's starting starting with Telly Savalas, who who was like, "Who loves you, baby?" Every time he saw you, he would just like kiss the back of your hand, and he was like so amazing. And then I, you know, I worked on a TV series with Chuck Norris, who was fabulous too. He, you know, he, a lot of his family worked on Walker Texas Ranger. It was like 
like a family. And then a couple other people that I, that I really loved was Leonardo the Cap Titanic. He was just a doll to work with. And it was in the early days of his career. He, he was wonderful. And then I had a couple other favorites. You know, I loved Diane Keaton. I doubled her on the Annie Hall. And uh, it was in New York. And actually, you know, they don't do that this, these days, but we actually, we shared a dressing room together. And I was little and young and she was she was so gracious and uh, there were so many people like Richard Chamberlain I mean he was the first person I ever had a crush on and when I when I worked with him I said oh my god Richard you know I had a crush on you when I was 13 and I invited you to my birthday party in New Jersey and he was so <laughs> gracious he said hey invite me now <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, what talking about Chuck Norris, what kind of stunts did you have to do for his show? Well, I doubled the lead, uh, Cherie Wilson, uh, who played his, his right-hand person in the show. So I doubled her. I did everything. I did car chases. I did uh, horse stuff, motorcycle fights, ran from explosions, just all kinds of stuff. I play actually played a part in, in the series, too, where when he was a little boy, his mom, he was working in the fields with his dad, and his mom was ringing the dinner bell for them to come in. The bad guys come rush back, and they shoot his dad, and then they take me and kill me. That's why he became Texas Ranger. So there were a ton of stunts. I'd be the, the lady shopping in the jewelry store and the bad guys would break in. And they, they'd knock me down. <laughs> now, was, <laughs> now was Chuck, how technical was he? Was he really, how good of a martial artist was he? He was sensational. I mean, he he really is the real deal. He knows his stuff. He was fantastic martial artist, and and he he you know, he could do the kicks and the fights. And, you know, he had a stuntman for the things that were super dangerous. Like one of the scenes was he was wing walking on a biplane and I was driving a convertible and the biplane catches up to me. And the stuntman had to jump from the wing of the airplane into my convertible while we're moving. That could easily have been tragic. So in stunts like that, he needed he needed a, a stunt double. How did you stay upbeat and positive, you know, in these situations? So, you know, I always take time, quiet time to myself before the stunt. And I mentally visualize the stunt going perfectly, absolutely perfectly from beginning to end. And then I focus and meditate on that by myself. I don't let anybody distract me. I just see the complete mental picture and then I go for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it takes mental concentration to uh, visualize it to go perfectly. And you know, sometimes, you know, at the last minute, you know, your passenger in the car will say, hey, Diane, what if this happens? And I'm like, please be quiet, sit there, and the stunt's going to go perfect. So yeah. you, you can't let other people's negativity crowd in your head. Have you ever spoke on that about, I mean, a lot of people don't utilize power of the mind. And I think that's a big deal, and I think a lot of people don't think about that. Have you ever spoke on that, or is, is that something you just learn naturally? Um, you know, I, I many years ago... I was I worked for people that had a company called the Bongo Board, and it was like a teeter top. And I was a teenager, and they saw me in a ski contest, and they asked me if I wanted to work for their company demonstrating this Bongo Board. And they gave me a book, Power of Positive Thinking, which. I was a teenager. I read that book and it, it influenced me family about the power of your mind. And I have talked about this in, in different seminars. I've, I've done some seminars for juvenile detention centers, um, did a UCLA seminar on the business of doing stunts. And I talk about how important it is to have your mindset and to visualize and to focus and to manifest things in your life. So yes, firm believer in that. Nice. Uh, I mean, because if you think about your position, first female stunt woman, and you're overcoming that hurdle, and then you have to deal with general fears that I guess everybody in the industry dealt with. Um, 
I mean, did you see a lot of people not make it in the business that just couldn't cut the mustard? Yes, yes. I saw a lot of people, um, many times I'd be working on location in different parts of the United States and they would hire, in Europe, and they would hire local people to do some of the easier stunts. Ask me, oh, you know, I really want to come to LA, but I'm afraid I won't get work. Like, you got to put the fear. You got to go for it. If, if you really want to do it, you, you can't stay in Peoria and expect to be you know, working very much. And so I I would encourage uh, young people to come out and go for it in the business. And some people hung in there and they made a success of their careers. And some people after the first year gave up doing other things. So, mm-hmm. you know, it takes a lot of... It takes a lot of stamina. It takes a lot of uh, knowing yourself, being able to take rejection and flip it around. Look at the rejection and say, that's not going to stop me. I'm going to find a way to do this and show everybody I can do it. Now, what type of physical shape did you have to be in like did you you exercise a lot or what was that like was there a lot of training yes i would you know daily go to the gym and do mainly aerobic exercises because you know not to build because most actresses that i doubled super thin so i didn't want to build and be bulky so i did a lot of aerobics and then i did uh taekwondo um, studied taekwondo for a number of years also did fencing classes i learned to scuba dive i i had a dirt bike that i would ride almost every day versus a couple times a week it was always training and taking far classes like Bob Bondurant School of High Performance Driving. And uh, yeah, so I was always, always trained. When you think about your career and so forth, I mean, were you that same person off camera or were you a total different person off camera? You know, do you kind of carry that energy? How, how is that? Is that you? through and through or is that a different person when you're off camera no it's definitely in my soul it's definitely through and through i i'm a, a super positive person in all areas of my life and i think i i give encouragement to people i meet in other sectors that i have too and you know i love kids and you know that's why i've done several of these detention center seminars and also volunteer with make a wish foundation when you when you think of full functionality of life, what do you, what do you think being a stump woman helped you with the most? Well, I, I think um, I think it helped me define what I wanted to do in life because before I had the epiphany that I wanted to do stunts, I was like, oh, you know, acting here, yeah, acting's fun, modeling's fun, but it wasn't like I wasn't on fire. But as soon as I realized that stunts Stunts is what I wanted to do with my life. I became almost obsessed with it and just focus. And it felt so good to have something to really focus on and, and make a path and follow it no matter what. And obstacles came up. Things happened. You know, um, when one of my friends was killed on the set that I was on, I was like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. Back to New Jersey. And I was just so depressed. And I got a, I wrote this in the book too. I got a job working in a dental office because that's what my mom did when she was young. And she's like, why don't you do that? You have a normal job. Do that for you know, like a month <laughs> or two and I was like ah oh. and then yeah. the book, I, I tell you that the, that the dentist that I worked for one day he popped out of this closet and he, he had a top hat on and he pulled a rabbit out of his hat and he said it was my dream to be a magician and I was like well why aren't you a magician <laughs> Yeah. And that was it. That was it. I said, oh, my God, I have to get back to L.A. <laughs> and follow my dream. I can't I can't do this. <laughs> well, that, that speaks to a lot because I think, you know, I've kind of been on that topic with a lot of conversations and interviews I've been doing about, you know, people kind of wake up in their life and they're not doing what they're passionate about, you know. And in a way, I think that stems from kind of how schools program kids and, and 
and you with how testing and trying to hit a grade and you don't really relish any information. You just memorize what you need to do to hit a grade and you're not building any value for yourself. And they go through life and they're still not doing anything with passion because they haven't built any value to start with because of how things were set up. But I mean, that speaks to stepping outside of that, I think is a, is a role model and is a big deal, you know, and I think people should listen to that. You know, and I don't, sometimes I don't think people, people have on the, their eye on the ball in that space to do what you really love to do. Because they say if you do what you love to do, you never feel like you ever work a day in your life. That's that's exactly right. And, you know, a lot of times parents crush the dreams of their children and they want them to take a safe route and rather than step out there and do something adventurous. They want to see them like in a regular job, getting a regular paycheck. And like having something to fall back on. And that crushes a kid's dream. I mean, you got to encourage a kid to follow that dream no matter what. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a big deal. Like when you go out here and speak, what, what is your, what's your, th what's your narrative when you do speak? Well, you know, it, people want to know, first of all, how I, how I got into stunts and, and they want to know if I've ever been hurt. And then they, they really like to know about the people that I doubled. And then I end my narrative with an inspirational message and talking about overcoming your fears and following your dreams because that is my message and you know i think if young people are taught that uh, to be fearless and to go for their dreams they there'd be a lot more happy people in the world instead of people going like robots nine to five to a job just to get a paycheck to live for the weekend instead of like you said when you love what you do it doesn't feel like work. well i came up with this other thought process that kind of relates to that if if you create a new environment with new ideas you eliminate opinions and controversy if you stay in an environment if you feed off an environment you will continue to have opinions and controversy and I think that can speak to people's lives in a way. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because because you're opening up a whole new door. And if yeah. And that that's so, so important. It's so important, like, to think outside the box. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's a big deal, and hopefully, hopefully they're going to make a movie a movie out of your book. Have you had any people checking it out? Well, yeah, yes, I have. I, you know, it, it's it's in the hands of a couple people. It's in the hands of a screenplay writer, um, a couple of other producers, and I'd really like to see it be made into a movie. And I would love Jennifer Lawrence to play me. <laughs> Just like that. If I was the casting director, I would cast her. I love her. I think she's great. I think the spunk and the attitude that do justice to the role. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be, if they did it right, it would be a big role. You know, I really do think, and it could be, I mean, there's nothing else like it, or there's been nobody else like you. And I don't think I've ever seen anything else like that you know, to have that representation out in the world, you know? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a real good time for it because, you know, women are, you know, now doing all kinds of jobs that we couldn't do before. And, and so this is just a one avenue where women have really come a long way, you know, from when I started in the beginning in New York, no stunt women, to now there's, there's plenty of stunt women around and really, really talented ones. So there's a, a lot of other jobs, you know, like I saw a lady farrier last week, you know, do horseshoeing a horse. And I was like, wow, that is really cool because traditionally... You know, it was it was a man's job. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to what you think you can do and what you think you can be successful doing, um, instead of questioning what you think you can do or what you think you can't do. You know, whatever it may be. So I think that's a that's a big deal, and everybody should definitely take note of that. And, and I guess the last question. I don't know if I asked you this question, but. What was the biggest fear you had doing a stunt in your career? Well, I mean, one huge fear I had was a movie I was going to do in South Africa. And I got the script. I read the script, loved it. It was called The River of Death. And I loved the script. And I'd be going to South Africa, which was really great. But in, in the script, I'm supposed to be running through a jungle and a boa constrictor 
dirt was going to fall and wrap around me. Now, I am terrified of snakes. <laughs> and the thought of this gigantic snake falling out of a tree and strangling me, and I could just picture the snake handler standing there, and the snake is strangling me, and the snake handler was like, that's his pet snake, and he doesn't want to kill it. So I was, I had a lot of sleepless nights before I got to South Africa. I, you know, I said to myself, I can do this. And so I went to South Africa and uh, I asked to go to the set to see the director. And I had worked with the director on a couple of the movies. And I said, hey, Steve, uh, when are we shooting the thing with the snake? Because I wanted to get it out of the way. He goes, oh, we shot that last week with the snake handler's wife. What's the matter? Are you afraid of snakes? And I'm like, nah. I was looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> what a relief that was. Yeah, right. If people want to find the book and find anything about Diane Peterson, where where we're gonna look for that style. So they can buy the book on Amazon. It's it's on Amazon. They can also go to my website, Hollywood Stunt Woman. Dot com and um, yeah, it's Barnes and Noble, and there's a lot of sites where you can uh, buy my book. Cool, cool. Well, Diane, I appreciate you coming back on. I think we got a good recording this time, and we'll get this thing, you know, uh, released. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're definitely a um, a leader in the space because there's not too many leaders at all. Is there anybody else out there that, that is doing what you did in this day and time? No, there, there, there isn't. So yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. That's a big deal. So true inspiration. This has been stunt Hollywood stunt woman, Diane Peterson. And I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of bang productions. Mm-hmm.